Are you recording this? Will it be recorded? Uh, uh, if if you uh, I have agree. no objection. Okay. Yeah, I okay. Have then, no I, then I will. Fact, so that I can put it on the YouTube as well. So. Yeah, as long as you make sure I have access to it, so I can go back and listen myself. It's yeah, fine with me. of yes. course, and uh, I can share the live link with you as well, so that if you want Great. to share, uh, but you need to have a Facebook, I guess. No, I don't. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I do, but I never go near it. It terrifies me. I, I don't. <laughs> okay. Was one one more thing. I just, in my case, don't need to try and manage. I'm already inundated. Okay. Yeah. I'll be right back, okay? Sure, sure. Just want to get something I forgot. Okay, I'm back. You are coming through the uh, compartment. Ah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this is the poster. Oh boy, that, that picture I... of me, huh? You found that picture. That's uh, uh, um, yeah, internet is a gold old. mine, you know. <laughs> My goodness, how things have changed. Huh? Uh, how old were you at the time? I don't know. I'm guessing it, that's probably, I think that's from when I first joined Columbia, so that's 25 years ago. Ah, so I would have been okay. maybe 45, 50 cool. at the most, 45, yeah. probably in my 40s. Yeah. I oh, just well. sh shared it. I... <laughs> I just shared it uh, you know, in the beginning of, of our discussion. So everyone knows that what this is about. Okay. Uh, I hope okay. they recognize me. Yes. <laughs> now yeah, they will. Here we are. Okay. <laughs> so uh, hi, everyone. Uh, we'll be talking about the book failure today why science is so successful uh, about this book um, so i'm pleased to announce today that we have the author of this book today uh, dr stuart firestein hi stuart how are you hello happy to be here thank you so much for the invitation it's a pleasure this should be very yeah, it's our it's our pleasure too uh, and uh, just for the audiences who don't know Stuart, I'm giving a little introduction about him. He's a professor and chair of the Department of Biological Sciences at the Columbia University. His lab works on vertebrate, vertebrate olfactory receptor neurons. He loves writing. He published numerous articles that have been published in uh, Wired Magazine, Huffington Post, Scientific American, etc. He has written two books so far. Well, first one is was published in 2011, that is called Ignorance, How It Drives Science. And his second book is called Failure, Why Science is So Successful, that was published in 2016. And this is the book that we'll be talking about today. Um, uh, Stuart, we will talk some basics uh, and some backgrounds of your writing first and so that the, the audience is here and on Facebook, they can ask questions later. Uh, so first, I want to ask you, uh, why have you become interested in uh, failures and ignorances? I mean, these are the two seemingly unuttered words when you connect a word with science. So, and why are you interested in describing science by these two words? Um, yes, well, I... Sort of by accident, of course, as these things often happen, I, ignorance was first, and it started really as a course at Columbia. And as I sort of, I think I say in the book somewhere that, that it, it came to me because of this sort of disconnect between 
the way I felt science was practiced and the way it was perceived. So I run a laboratory at Columbia. You're all probably in laboratories one sort or another. And you know, it's really, it's the best life in the world. It's exciting, it's interesting. We talk about big questions and experiments and it's really, you know, it's challenging, but it's exhilarating. I can't wait to get to work in the morning. And I also teach as a professor, you know, I, I have some teaching responsibilities. I teach a large class in neuroscience and it's very challenging as well and interesting to put together and organize a large number of lectures, but I never found it particularly exhilarating in the way that working in the lab was. And I thought, well, you know, so there's this pursuit of science in the lab and this perception of science in the class and they don't really fit together. And I thought, well, what's missing from the class? And of course, what was missing from the class was the fact that in, in the lab, we ask questions. We're only interested in what we don't know, not in what we do know. Whereas the class was a big textbook and a lot of lectures, and it was all about what we do know. And I came to realize by the end of the class that these course undergraduate students must have thought that science was pretty much neuroscience, the brain, we pretty much knew everything. We had a big thick textbook. I'm fond of saying we used a textbook then by uh, called Principles of Neuroscience, a big, huge book. And I looked on Amazon and it's 1400 pages and it weighs seven and a half pounds, which is twice the weight of an adult human brain. So, you know, what does that mean somehow? So I thought these students must somehow think we know everything there is to know about the brain, which is clearly not true. And that the purpose of science is to learn all these facts and stuff them in textbooks for people to memorize. And that's not really what we do either. So I tried to identify what was missing and I thought what was missing was that what we don't know. So I came up with this course. I thought I'd try a course on what I called ignorance to be, of course, intentionally provocative. I don't mean stupidity or a callow indifference to fact as we know too well where that goes, but I just mean the larger communal unknown that what we're ignorant of as it were and can find out or believe we can find out. So I started this class on that and um, the class really just consisted of my having inviting members of our science faculty to come and talk with the students in a seminar kind of setting for a couple of hours, one night a week about what they didn't know, what their question was, how they came to that question, why that question was important, et cetera, et cetera. A, at some moment, uh, an editor from Oxford Press, who was a friend of mine, wanted to have dinner and she came to the class first and we were gonna have dinner afterwards. And she said, I think you should write a book about this, which I never thought about doing. But I thought, okay, that sounds interesting. I'll try it. I do have an abiding interest in public accessibility to science, communicating science to the public, which I think is a crucial, what we now see in the middle of this situation that we find ourselves in, how important communicating science to the public is and how difficult it is, how non-trivial a problem it actually is um, to communicate science to the public and how non-trivial a problem it is for the public to understand how science works, uh, what to believe. I mean, you know, the people who imitate science, the, the pseudoscience out there is quite good at imitating us. We should be flattered, you know, imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. So in some ways we should be flattered that these people out there who are pseudoscientists trying to sell people a bill of goods, um, some snake oil business realize that the best way to do that is to pretend you're being scientific. Of course, they're not being scientific, but it's not so easy to recognize the difference. So I'm off on a little tangent now, but that's why I think it's important to be able to communicate science to the public and why it's not so trivial to do, why it's actually quite difficult. Um, if you ask people how to tell the difference between real science and pseudoscience, we don't always know sometimes. And listen, great scientists didn't know. You know, it's famously Isaac Newton left more writing behind in the area of alchemy than he did in physics. So what, what can I say, you know, and he was a firm believer in intelligent design as well. So, you know, you don't have to be right about everything. So anyway, I wrote about ignorance and the book became somehow popular or reasonably popular among a general audience. I was happy to see that and particularly among students. And so Oxford Press, who published it, came back to me and asked if I'd like to write another book. And I said, well, to be honest with you, the only other thing I know about with science is failure because we do that a lot. And they said, oh, that sounds great. Write a book on that. So now I have these two books on ignorance and failure, this little niche that I <laughs> sort of put together for myself, as it were. But I do think they are the, um, 
I mean, we all know this. The trouble is we in science know that the only thing that's interesting are the questions. When we go to a meeting, we don't sit around and talk to each other about what we know. I mean, you may present a paper about some data, but mostly you go to the bar or afterwards or lunch or wherever you're going, and you all talk about what we don't know and how we're going to find this out. And what's the critical question in the field and who's doing what work on it? So, so that's what we talk about as scientists. And we also all realize that you know, a significant number of the experiments that we do are doomed to failure, and that's good. I mean, that, we, know they're, we know things are working right when they're failing right. So these two words that have this, you know, pejorative meaning to the public actually have a positive meaning in science, and I think are important to understanding science. So that was my campaign. That's my flag-waving campaign, is to try and make these words not pejorative, but positive, to show the public how these are positive ideas in science. Sorry, that was a rather long-winded answer. You know, no, that's that's really interesting. And uh, I was wondering, what's your process of writing a book? I mean, uh, you, you are a teacher, you teach. Uh, a lot of these things are covered, I guess, in your, in your course, ignorance. Uh, so when you write a book, what do you keep in mind? And do you discuss with people? I, I know you have mentioned some people here in the acknowledgement sections and how the book has been written, but could you please explain a little uh, in front of us? Sure, I can. Of course, I'm not a professional writer, at least of popular books. I mean, I think we should all realize that in science, it's probably a profession that does almost as much writing as a professional writer does. One of the, one of the main activities we do as scientists, and for those of you who are now graduate students or postdocs, you'll find this to be ever more true, for better or worse. But Aside maybe from lawyers and journalists or professional writers, we are probably the profession that does the most writing of any in the world. We write papers, we write reports, we write grants, we write articles, uh, we write letters of recommendation. Um, we, you know, we spend a lot of time uh, writing. And so it's a skill that I think is really worthwhile um, uh, honing. It's, it's a skill that's worthwhile understanding and learning to the extent you can. And of course, we don't really teach it, so that makes it more difficult. When I was, um, I'll get to the process in a moment, I promise you, but when I was the chair of my department, we have a rotating chairmanship. I was chair for three years in the Department of Biology not so long ago, and the lasting legacy, I feel, of my chairmanship, the thing that was most important that I did while I was there was I actually hired as a member of our staff, a resident writer, a writer who I knew, who was a nonfiction writer, who had an MFA in nonfiction writing from Columbia's School of the Arts. And she was a brilliant science writer. She writes regularly in the Times and the all, you know, Wall Street Journal and all the magazines and so forth. And so she doesn't really write books that much, but but she is a professional writer and you can teach writing. And so she teaches writing to our graduate students and postdocs and is there and available to the faculty, uh, even on grants. And what's remarkable is that here's a person who, um, who, although she's a professional writer, she's not a professional scientist. She writes science, she writes about science, in particular neuroscience, but she doesn't have a technical background. And yet she's quite able to help people write very technical grants and things like that and clear up their writing and make it clearer and help them write more efficiently and effectively and communicate, which is critical. So, all right, so my process. So I learned a lot from her. I, she was a great deal of help and things like that. Anyway, um, my process, you know, the first thing was I needed a bit of a discipline because it, it's not that easy to do. You have a lot of distractions, a lot of other things that, that want your time when you're running a laboratory and all the rest of that. So, and I'm not really a morning person, but I realized that the only time that people thought I wasn't available was really early in the morning. So I adopted a discipline which worked for me, which was to wake up every morning at six or to start working at six a.m., which was not fun. Not my favorite time of the day, but nobody wanted me at 6 a.m. Everybody knew I'd be in a terrible mood anyway. So, <laughs> so I would work from 6 a.m. until about 7.30. That was it, an hour and a half a day. But I was quite religious about it. I mean, I did it virtually every day. Maybe one day a week I would do it or whatever, but virtually every day. And I would also stop at 7.30, uh, even if I was going great. In fact, the better things were working the better it was to stop at 7.30, write a few notes about where it was going and then leave it. 
because it's in the back of your head all day and what you're doing. And suddenly you think of this, oh, and you can write that note down. And also, if you were doing something you were really interested in writing, if you were writing some piece of it that you were interested in and you stopped, then it's much easier to get up at six o'clock the next morning and get back to it. Then if you come to a dead end and you six o'clock the next morning, you have to wake up and go, well, now what am I going to, you know, where am I going to start now? So that turned out to be a very important little trick that worked very well for me. And I still do that to a large extent. Um, so it's important, I think, to put aside a time and it doesn't have to be a lot of time. You can, it's remarkable if you sit down and you say, I'm not going to open my email. I'm not going to look on the web unless it's for research. I'm not going to dick around with this or that. I'm just going to write or read or rewrite, revise, but I'm only gonna do something relevant to the book, to what I'm working on in the book right now. And you spend an hour and a half doing that, you, you can bang out a thousand words pretty well, or 1500 words even in an hour and a half. They may not be the best words, and you may have to go back and revise them. But if you do that every day for six months, you've written a book, remarkably, yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. yeah, it's more like a making a routine for you, doing a job kind of routine it, it helps in an odd way it seems like being that disciplined you should just write when you feel creative and all that that's bullshit you never feel creative <laughs> but, and if you wait for that you'll wait for forever yeah um so in the first chapter failing to define failure you mm -hmm. have quoted gertrude stain a real failure does not need an excuse it is an end in itself so uh probably it will sound a little weird, but how do you define failure? I mean, uh, we make mistakes, we make errors, failure can be the result of that, or failure can be uh, completely a different thing. I mean, you don't make mistakes, you don't make errors, but you still fail, you try and you fail. So how do you actually define a failure? Is, well, the, uh, the way I like to, uh, so I think you can define failure, for me, the interesting way to define it is in, in science. What, is, what does failure mean in science? So, of course, you know, failing in the real world, I, I mean, it, you don't want catastrophic failure. That's not good. Um, I'm, not, I'm not here to suggest that failing is the best thing in the world to do. But, but I think if you can develop this idea of failure this Gertrude Stein idea, and admittedly, Gertrude Stein is quite enigmatic in her statements, and you know, uh, but but they're deep. They they are a deep statement, I think, and so that's why I started the book with that quote because I thought that's this is the most difficult way to think about failure as an end in itself. It needs the important thing in there is it needs no excuse. You don't have to say, "Oh, I'm sorry, I screwed that up. I didn't, you know, I blew that. I, I made this stupid mistake." That, okay, that's all certain kind of failure that, that if you could avoid it, we would avoid it. One should learn to be patient a bit with it and put up with it because none of us are perfect and that's the way that's going to go. But that's not really the kind of failure I'm talking about. I'm talking about productive failures because failures can unquestionably be just as productive as successes. Indeed, I think they can be more productive. I think success, although it seems like something we want, is, is another quote I have in there from Ben Franklin, arguably America's first scientist, and, and other people have said this too, that success is rather narrow. I mean, you know, it, it's a kind of a second law of thermodynamics. There's a limited number of ways you can succeed, but there's an endless number of ways you can fail, right? And so, and so that's really a much more interesting terrain to explore. You succeed, that's great. Write it down, put it in the textbook. And what? So the best successes are the ones that lead to questions, better questions. And failures can lead to better questions just as well as successes do. Maybe better. I like to say that, you know, if, if science is about the unknown, ignorance, if you will, then the deepest kind of unknown is the unknown unknown, right? The things we don't even know, we don't even know. Now, people have made jokes about that phrase, but it's actually a very thoughtful thing to say, I think. Um, I'm, I'm not the one who made it up. Actually, it first appears in a poem by D.H. Lawrence, but that's another story altogether. Um, but this idea of what we don't know we don't know is a very deep kind of fundamental ignorance. And how do you get to that? How do you figure out what you don't know you don't know? Well, you figure that out by failing. You do an experiment because you don't know something and you expect this result and it will tell you something about what you didn't know and it doesn't work. It doesn't give you the result you expected. Well, now you know 
that you really didn't even know something else that you didn't know you didn't know, as it were. And you have to go really back to the beginning and rethink this in a deeper way. And that's when the game really is on. That's when we get creative in science. And so that kind of failure is a portal to the unknown unknown is I think what we want to uh, cultivate. That's yeah, what I would call a failure that needs no excuse. And failure is much more diverse than the success, right? You, you actually mentioned in one place uh, about uh, Lev Tolstoy writing in the in a Karenina, uh, where he was saying that the, the, reasons, yeah, the, the reasons for unhappiness is more diverse and and there are a lot of reasons, but for being happiness, you don't need that many right. reasons. Right, you know, ha yes, happy people are all happy in the same, in much the same way, but unhappy people are unhappy in thousands of different ways. So there's a lot more to write about. Yes, I call this the Anna Karenina principle. That's where he states that, I think. But yes, I think that's true. So in general, the history of errors and, uh, and failures is far more interesting than that of successes. Um, one of my, I don't want to pretend that I've read this book, but Kepler's Astronomia, Astronomia Nova, which is, you know, the beginnings of real, not the beginnings, but one of the critical foundational works in astronomy. It's a very interesting book to browse through. I wouldn't read it. It's rather thick and it's rather difficult and all that. But it's a very interesting book to browse through because he goes through all of the failures he had before he came up with the idea of elliptical orbits. And some of the failures are outlandish, they're crazy, but he goes through them in great detail because he says, this is the process by which I came to elliptical orbits. And I had, there was no shortcut. I couldn't have done it in another order. I couldn't have come up with elliptical orbits first. These failures are crucial to understanding, you know, it, it's a little bit like for me, knowing about the failures that went on is a little bit like in, in, um, maybe to use a sort of a physics analogy or a math analogy, it's like deriving an equation as opposed to just knowing the equation. You can know an equation and you can just plug the numbers in and get your solution, right? And get whatever, solve whatever problem you want. But if you really want to understand what's going on, somewhere along the line, you should have gone through a derivation of that equation. And that's what we do. That's how we educate ourselves, right? Then you really unsee the thought process. And if you were really if it was really taught well, we would go through all the mistakes that were made in the derivation originally that had to be cleaned up and sorted out before we came to the final equation, as it were. So I think that gets us to the process. Um, yeah, and uh, in, uh, so is there any fundamental difference between, uh, in failure between science, failure in science and failure in general? I mean, if uh, in one place you actually quoted uh, as well, if you fail, fail better. How can you fail better? I, this, is a, this is a famous Samuel Beckett quote. Um, right, right. Who's, you know, just about as enigmatic as Gertrude Stein. So, um, th and this is a phrase that, this is a phrase that comes from, an, uh, from a late novel of his, uh, ever try, ever fail, try again, fail again, fail better. The reason I like this quote, uh, in the book, I think I, I wrote that I, originally I was going to write about that. Somebody had reminded me of this quote, uh, an English novelist who I happened to know. And she said, oh, you know that Beckett quote? And I had forgotten about it completely. I did know it, but I'd forgotten about it. And, um, and so I started to write about it. And then I found out that it had been adopted by the, uh, by the, the tech world as one of their favorite you know, motivational quotes. So I thought, well, all right, I've been scooped. I'll just leave that go. But then I began reading the way they thought about it. And I thought that's all wrong, that this is not what Beckett meant at all. Um, that, that this is not just one of these try, fail, try, fail, have perseverance and get better at it. You know, This idea of failing better is a really deep idea. It, it's not that you try again, fail again, try again, fail again, eventually you succeed. It's that you learn to fail better. You learn this process of failing in a better way, in a way that brings you more knowledge with each new failure, which isn't just a, a flop, you know, but it's a failure that's, that's exploration, that's examination, that's investigation. And so the failure takes you someplace. It takes you to some new and interesting place. It doesn't just drop you off. Now that's not true in every 
you know, in every endeavor that human beings do. I don't think you have to, you know, I, I don't think you have to be a terrible lawyer and lose a bunch of cases before you become a good lawyer. I don't think you have to fail in law before you become, I don't think you have to, you know, you don't have to kill a bunch of people to become a good doctor first. <laughs> no, I, I think you can, in some areas, failures like that, those are not very useful failures. So one of the wonderful things about science is that it's developed this method, if you will, this, this way in which we can fail in a non-catastrophic way. You can fail, you can screw up quite a lot in the lab, and it won't ruin your career for quite a long time. You can get by, you know, as long as your experiments are interesting, then, then people will continue to support you. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I will be coming to the audiences uh, uh, yeah. in a while. I, 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 they will ask questions and they have asked some questions already. But first, uh, as you mentioned that we need to design a scientific system that helps you fail better. I mean, our current is our current system uh, doing that because people tend to, in science, tend to not report the failure and our publication systems don't support it. Some have started some efforts recently, but I don't see much future in this system. Uh, like you, you cannot report a failure in, in, in science and, and people try to hide their failure because their career may get destroyed. Uh, for example, there are some famous uh, examples that some people retracted their uh, publications after they found out that they failed in that exam experiment and and uh, and the results are not true uh, not everyone has the uh, uh, courage or or the system does not support that to for example to the young scientists uh, yes. so how do you propose to change all these yeah this is not this is not a trivial problem as you as you pointed out just from your list and there's even more to it than that i mean there are issues of funding and promotion and all the rest of this that are all tied to uh, measures of success they're never tied to a measure of failure no no tenure committee no grant committee uh, study section or anything like that sits down and says, well, what did, 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 did he or she have a bunch of interesting failures? I mean, let's look at the failures. How, how interesting were they? How courageous was this person? Um, how, you know, how thoughtful were they? How imaginative were they? Uh, they don't think about that. I agree. And so the system is, is certainly not rigged for accepting failure. That said, and, and you know, changing it it's very difficult to understand how to change it because theoretically we run it. I mean, you know, it's scientists who sit on the study sections that review grants. The tenure committees are made up of faculty, at least in theory, who could change the way they do these things. And everybody complains about it, but actually making the change seems to be quite difficult to do. Um, I, don't, I don't have a good formula for it, except to write about it, um, to push it a little bit. I think open publications are important this way. Um, the idea of in, in, in this sort of open publishing era, I think you can begin to include a certain number of failed experiments. I mean, I could imagine now, I, 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 it's, it's difficult to imagine publishing a paper about your failure, but it isn't difficult to imagine publishing a paper which included an appendix which said, by the way, here are all the things we did that we fucked up with first, right? You know, here's the things we went with. There's a wonderful article that I recommend highly um, for a public audience, it's meant, but, it, but you would find it interesting as well. It's by a man named Peter Medawar. Peter Medawar was a very famous immunologist in England. He was a Nobel laureate. He's the man who discovered the, uh, the ability of the immune system, how the immune system recognizes self from non-self. So he's often called the father of transplantation because even though his work was basic research and not clinical, it enabled us to understand how, why you couldn't transplant organs without dealing with the immune system. In any case, Medivar was also a wonderful public communicator of science. He was, I hope this means something to some of you guys. He was sort of the Carl Sagan of England, if you will, um, in his day. And he wrote quite a bit as well. He wrote some beautiful things. And one article he wrote was in a magazine called the Saturday Review. You can find this online in a minute, you know, just Google it, it's there. And it's called, is the scientific paper fraudulent? And his answer was yes. 
And what he meant by this, of course, was not that it was untruthful, but that the scientific paper is arranged in such a way that it's quite different from the way the experiments were actually done, as we all know. So quite often the last experiment you did winds up being the first one in the paper and things like that, because you rearranged it in some sort of a sensible narrative, which was not the way you actually went about the discovery. And you leave out all the failed experiments as if they were unimportant in the process. So, and I think that's still the way we'll publish the paper, but I do think it would be interesting to have an appendix, an addendum, a supplemental material section that said, by the way, here's the stuff that didn't work. And I think that would be, that, that could become more and more interesting for people. I mean, if we started doing it, it would become more and more interesting. So that's so, one possible way yeah, to do it, yeah, rather, yeah. Than to, rather than trying to sort of journal of failed experiments, which will be hard to sell. Sorry, did you, are you a little frozen, I think, Con? Okay. Which means yeah, I may be uh, really. Oh, there you are, okay. Okay, okay. Uh, yeah, my internet connection sometimes uh, is unstable. So they're, they're all, <laughs> if you will see me frozen, that. you can keep talking or wait for me. I will be back. Well, I never like, know. Sometimes minutes. I've found that when other, the other person is frozen, so am I to them. I, you never know for sure. Oh, yeah. It's difficult well, to figure I'm, out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, so you think the uh, graduate student thesis papers are more uh, uh, liberating in this sense that they can publish better uh, fail failed experiments than the published ones because everyone wants a story, a coherent story, and may, like yeah. when you and making the coherent story makes you a fraudulent publisher as well. I mean, uh, you, you need to pretend that you thought the last experiment at the beginning and then right. the first experiment at the last. So yes. I, I guess the uh, the thesis papers that the graduate students write. Well, I think can... that's exactly, yes, I think that's exactly right. There was a move in my department several years ago and in several science departments to say to students, look, you know, we, we expect at, by the end of your graduate career, your thesis should result in a couple of papers, you know, in the, in the literature. You should be able to publish a, two or three papers out of it, maybe one major, one to my way, whatever it was. And we will let you, as a thesis, just write a short introduction and a little bit of a discussion at the end, some, you know, future perspectives thing at the end, and then just staple your three papers in the middle, and that'll be your thesis. And I objected to this, along with a few other members of our faculty. I objected to it because the, the idea was why, why do we have them writing these long theses when they've already written a paper and that's what they need to do, let them get on with their life. I understand that a little bit. But I said, you know, here's the thing. The thesis is the only record I have, as somebody who runs a lab, it is the only record I have of everything this student did. And four or five years from now, another student will come along and say, you know, I have an idea about an experiment. And I can say, well, you know, we tried that at one time and maybe it could work now, maybe your idea is better, but let's go back and look and see what happened when we tried that before. And we go back to that thesis and we see it. And I think it's also valuable for a student to have that record because otherwise it gets lost. You know, this is lost somewhere on some floppy disk in the lab that you can no longer run on a, on a modern day computer or whatever the particular medium is that's no longer available. And you really don't wanna lose that. So I think it's valuable for a graduate student to sit down and actually go through that process of writing a thesis and putting down everything they did, including the failures and what they thought about it. Um, it's, a, it's, it's a very worthwhile intellectual thing to do. And it's the last time in your life you'll be able to do it. So <laughs> <laughs> right. without somebody saying, what the hell is that, you know, so. <laughs> Yeah, and interesting, uh, since you mentioned about open science publications, uh, and uh, in your book, you have uh, actually given an example of one uh, protein called A, A beta protein that is yes. related to Alzheimer's disease. Uh, and when first it was reported to be connected with, uh, with the Alzheimer's disease, thousands of publications have uh, have uh, been published after that and everyone went after that protein and published everything on that i see similar trend in cancer as well if, if there yeah. the cancer proteome is huge but 
10 at best proteins are hugely studied thousands of uh, publications are on those 10 proteins not the other ones so this is a real big problem also uh, it is connected to funding as well if you don't know about something you won't get funding the funding system don't uh, reward you with unknown stuff that you want to go that's after right. unknown things that's right so, well I'll I'll, I'll give you a little hint about that. I had a long discussion about this at one time with Sidney Brenner, who's a very famous molecular yeah, biologist yeah, right, who right. passed away just a couple of years ago. He, many of you would know who he is, of course. And he was a very clever guy. He wrote several, he used to write a column in Current Biology that I recommend very highly to read through even today. He's very thoughtful. Well, we were talking about this one time. I was in Cambridge and he lived in Cambridge. So we had some discussions and we were talking about this very issue of funding and all that. I remember Sidney saying, well, you know about NIH grants, I mean, because he had, even though he was English, he used to get those as well. He said, the thing about NIH grants is they come in two parts. The first half are all the experiments you've already done. And the second half are all the experiments you're never going to do. <laughs> and, you know, there's some, some truth to that in the sense that the way to get the grants is to, um, wait, hold on a second. Is there a way you could make that a little less noisy? Wait, hold on. Yes. Okay. Sorry. Just no, that's fine. Get rid of yeah, some yeah. of the background noise. Okay. No, no, that's um, fine. That's fine. Okay. So, so, um, yes, you know, I mean, uh, this is an awful thing to say, but that's a kind of a grantsmanship thing to do, which is, you know, you write your grant about something you think you know about, and you can say it's likely to succeed and what people want to see. And then, but you take the money and you take some portion of it and you use it on your really, you know, your pet project. That, uh, that you think could really be interesting and you, you, know, you take that risk with it. So you risk some of it. It's a, little, you know, you, it's a little Las Vegas feeling, but that's what you do. You get the grant money and then in the end, you can kind of do what you want with it as long as you come back in five years and say, well, I've done something here. And here's something interesting, but it is certainly a problem. I mean, this year, for example, or not this year, but the last several years, NIH has put aside a, a certain percentage of their grant money for what they call high risk, high impact projects. These are things where they welcome a grant where it's very risky, very little preliminary data. It's a good idea, but could easily fail. But if, if it works, it would have great impact. Uh, so that sounds fabulous. That's a great idea. It's 1.5% of the NIH budget. So that effectively means to me that 98.5% of the NIH budget is devoted to incremental crap that nobody cares about and has you know, no likelihood of being a high impact. Now, I don't think that's what we want, but that's what it means, you know? So, so that's the problem, yes. And it, it's, a, it's a structural problem that needs a very deep fundamental change, which, you know, it's, it's hard to imagine exactly. I mean, so private philanthropy helps a little bit on that and it, it, only at least in the fact that it gives you maybe a certain kind of money that will take a riskier project on, will let you do the risky work that NIH has trouble with. Of course, NIH has its own set of problems because it's a political, you know, it's a, it's a political organization that has to answer to taxpayers, who, you know, senators and Congress people and all that. But, so not, nonetheless, we should recognize that it's, you know, right. it's much better than it's ever been as well. Well, not of that course, it's ever course, been. Yeah. There have been maybe better things, but there is still a vast amount of money that is put into scientific research, public money. Okay, thanks. Uh, I will ask uh, other people to ask questions. You can react, uh, you can press uh, or raise your hand by reacting uh, or uh, ask the question in the chat box. Uh, meanwhile, there is one question in the chat box and there was uh, where other questions in the, uh, in the Google form. I will ask you momentarily uh, but meanwhile, I will just uh, talk about a, a little uh, different thing. That's serendipity. That's uh, uh. that's what you have mentioned in your book. And a lot of you, you have mentioned that if you ask Nobel laureates, a lot of them will say that, OK, serendipity, that's not my credit. But they don't mention about the thousands of failures that occurred in the Precisely. Right. Precisely. And, uh, so, yes. And uh, there's a famous example of the G protein uh, uh, function that uh, to the audience who does not know, uh, 
there was a glassware that went for washing. So there was a D aluminum in the detergent. Uh, and so the aluminum came to the uh, bacteria where they were growing the protein and then or cell culture. And then the, the, the protein got the aluminum and became active. And from then on, people started putting uh, aluminum in the, uh, or other metals in the proteins like that to uh, act, activate the protein. And that, that work or the serendipitous work helped, uh, helped getting the Nobel Prize on the G protein later on. And one of my, uh, uh, my, my PhD supervisor used to tell one story that there was a ribosome structure that they they could not crystallize that that and then one day it fell on the bench top took they took it from the bench top and then set the crystal trays and it crystallized so yeah. this is these are the lucky uh, accidents um, what you can say but we don't mention you're right we don't mention about the thousands of other failed experiments that helped us coming to that the the winning point Right. So, the, so my worry about serendipity, which has become a favorite sort of word to use with science now that, you know, well, one, in fact, a lot of people use it to support basic so-called basic or fundamental research, as opposed to, say, constantly looking at, at translational research or only supporting translational research. This is another topic we could talk about separately. But, but one, of the, one of the rationales they use for it is, well, basic research, a lot of discoveries happen by accident but they've become extremely important in medicine and engineering and all sorts of other places. Um, but they happen by accident because of basic research. And so people use this idea of serendipity as a positive and, and will now claim you hear more and more, even scientists will say, well, you know, yeah, it's a great discovery, but really I just, I stumbled on that or it happened by accident or an experiment failed and I saw this instead. But I think it's important to recognize that so there's some sense that this is all that we're doing science, but it's all by accident. Nobody's really making great discoveries. They're just, you know, falling into this stuff by accident. But I think it's important to realize that it only happens when you're working hard on something. I mean, lawyers don't make serendipitous scientific discoveries. I don't care if they work 18 hours a day. They're not going to make a serendipitous scientific discovery. Indeed, as a biologist, a neurobiologist, I'm not likely to make a serendipitous discovery in physics you know, um, and vice versa. So I think the important thing to realize is it's the famous quote from Louis Pasteur, you know, the chance favors the prepared mind. Yes, and, right. and Pasteur was a, a, a great recipient of chance and good luck as it were, and serendipity, but it was because it favors the prepared mind. And I think that's the crucial idea that, that and, and that's very important to a scientist as well. That is the, the readiness to look at a failed experiment and try and think through, through, try and reason through that in ways that is not commonsensical or intuitive. A lot of people say, you know, many discoveries in science are made by intuition. We use our intuition a lot and we do to some extent, but I would say the really great discoveries are made by counter intuition. By, by thinking in a way that's not just simply the intuitive way, but by welcoming in a, a perspective that seems crazy. Like, for example, that the, you know, the earth goes around the sun, <laughs> which, you know, it just doesn't look that way really, does it? Yeah. So, so I, I think that's important to be, able to, to be able to do that. And that's when serendipitous discoveries occur. And, and it's from failures, again, that, that we learn to think in a counterintuitive way, to force ourselves to think Oh, there must be something we're just not seeing here, whether it's you know metal ions or, or some crap on the bench. Many, many, many people have told me yes, the you know the protein band that works the best is the stuff the one that fell on the floor. That's where the results always come from. So you cut it up, and pull it <laughs> right? Up, pick that one up. Don't throw yeah, that away. Crystallization is a is a black magic. People say. <laughs> yes. Well, it is a bit in a way. Um, but, but that's because there's a great deal about it we don't know. And that's really important to recognize is that you don't have to know everything to succeed or to fail usefully. You, you know, science doesn't have to know the whole story in order to progress. So, uh, yeah. 
Uh, I agree, and thanks for explaining. Uh, one of the questions came from the audience is, is how many times have you failed writing this book? <laughs> well, I, I'm not sure what you mean by failed write it, in writing the book. I guess what you mean is how much rewriting did I do? How many things did I revise and rewrite? So, I, I guess that's what he asked, yeah. Yes, um, because I, I, mean, I wrote the book and I published it, so I guess, you know, and um, I, I don't know whether it was a failure or not. I, don't, I think it's done okay. It got nice reviews. People say nice things about it. You guys are reading it. So, um, but in terms of revising it, in terms of reworking much of it, that happens to be, for me, my favorite part of writing. So many people hate that. They hate revising. They hate going over things again and again. They like to write it and be done with it. And if you're good enough, I guess that's fine. I find that I'm not. I find that I it's easier for me to write just to write almost not quite stream of consciousness, but to write with as few restrictions or worries about grammar even or word choice or anything else. Just write what I kind of am thinking about. And then I but then I go back and I revise and I really revise almost sentence by sentence. I, I in fact I do revise sentence by sentence. I I just there's an old phrase that I was taught by this um by the science writer who I told you about earlier, me and Chris is her name that, that we hired in our department. And the phrase that writers use is, uh, why am I telling you this now? That you should always ask yourself about something you're writing. Why am I telling you this now? But the important thing about that phrase is you repeat it and each time you repeat it, you put the emphasis on a different word. Why am I telling you this now? Why am I, why am I telling you? Why am I telling you this and why now, you know? And every one of those questions you could ask about virtually every sentence. Now you'll never get anywhere if that's what you do, but you have to have that attitude. So I revise quite a lot. So I would say, yeah, the book is, was, was full of failures and I hope is full of fewer of them now, but, but it's there. <laughs> you know, if I wrote it today, I would write it differently. There are things I would include, there were things I would leave out, there were things I would expand on. I'm sure I would write it quite differently if I wrote a second edition of it. Yeah, um, there is one question by Onu Bhav that and Kahua D, but I will come to you momentarily. Uh, I want to ask one question to Dr. Firestein. Uh, and that's also from the audiences. They sent us uh, from the Google form. Uh, and that was, is. I, I, I know the answer, but I'm asking it in a different way. His question was, is there any universal truth? And if, so as you mentioned in the beginning that people try to use the science to uh, dismantle science or, or use it against science, the pseudoscience and, and stuff. People try to say that, okay, science fails. Science does not know all the answers. So there should be a, a a book or a religion or a idea that says everything that, that that book says this is universal truth so science cannot whatever science cannot prove the book says this so how do you counter, counter these kind of uh, ideas um, or, or 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 counter science arguments all right if i if i understand the question properly i would say that the the um one of the keys to understanding science, to understanding it as a process and to realizing why it's been so successful is that science developed an idea about truth, which I would call provisional belief. I'm not alone in this. There's a wonderful book. I'll think of the author's name in a minute um, and the title of it. I'll get it for you in a moment. She's a philosopher of science, at, at, I, I think at Harvard, but I'm not positive okay. of that. In any case, and, and it's about this idea of provisional belief. That is, you don't have to have the final answer in order to believe that you have some truth, some valuable uh, bit of knowledge. And indeed in, in science, as is not true in many other places, revision is a victory. I mean, this is what science is about. We say something, but we know it will be revised. Um, a man named John Maddox, who was the editor of Nature for over 20 years, longest editor, of, he died a few years ago, but he was once asked, actually, I think it's, yeah, I, I, the story is a little fuzzy, but basically he was once, his wife tells the story that he was once asked by a journalist, 
how many papers does he think that nature publishes which turn out to be wrong? And he said, oh, that's easy, all of them. And that's in some ways true. They all have something wrong about them. They're not 100% wrong, but they will all be superseded by something that's closer to right, if you will. So maybe there is an ultimate truth with a capital T, I don't know. But, I, but what I do know is we're nowhere near ultimate, it seems to me. So why behave that way? Why behave as, that's, as if that's the only thing that's valuable? When we get close to ultimate, then we can worry about it. But right now, that's not where we are. So let's be realistic about where we are and get the truth that we can get. And I think it's important to recognize that unsettled science is not unreliable science, right? Unknowns are not, un, you, you know what I mean? It's, a, it's unsettled science is right. valuable science. I mean, it, it asks important questions and that's what we need to have. We need more questions. Right. Uh, I'm not sure that's the answer, but it's the closest no, no, I can that's, get. But provi uh, that's provisional belief is, I would say, the critical idea. Uh, yeah, well, the yeah. book is called True Enough. Okay. To look up the uh, author, but I forget the author's name, but the book okay. is called True Enough. I actually would advise it as, as a reading, as a book for you guys to read it. It's yeah. intended not for a deep philosophical audience necessarily. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I got through it, so you can certainly get through it. It's, for, <laughs> it's quite interesting. I mean, it's about, there's a book like it, um, which is also a current book by a woman named Naomi Oreskes. Uh, Naomi Oreskes is a philosopher and historian of science. She just she's now at Harvard, I believe. So she's okay. in your neighborhood, as it were. Yeah. And she she wrote a recent book called Why Should We Trust Science? And of course, sure. she's very interested. She's sort of doing for climate change what other people did for the tobacco issues. You know, how people are nefariously turning science kind of against itself, using doubt as, a, as an anti-science thing. Whereas in science, we doubt everything. That's the basis of science is right. doubt. And so the attempt to use it against us, against science is of course, you know, it's a political ploy and it worked for a while with tobacco and it's working in climate change now and it's a well-known strategy. So she writes about that. But both of those books, one is called uh, 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 True Enough. True Enough, yep. Yes. And I'll, one I'll, another is the Why Should We Trust Science? Yes, Naomi Oreskes is Why Should We Trust Science? Yeah. And um, true enough, I'll find for you in a moment. Sure. Just have to... uh, but go on, you can ask me another question. Yeah, meantime. yeah. meanwhile, uh, Anubhav Dotto, could you please ask your question? Uh, sure, actually, my question was that we are discussing about the pursuit of success and failure in science and the importance of public funding. But there's not much attempt to tell the average taxpayer that why this success is important in our practical daily life. So, Dr. Feinstein, how can you suggest we take some steps to improve that relation between science and the general ignorant public? Um, yes. Uh, I, well, I'd be careful with the word ignorant public, of course, because, because you won't make any friends with that, even though I know kind of what you mean about it. Um, yes, I, I, listen, I think science has the responsibility and scientists have the responsibility to try and communicate with the public. There's no reason that science should be any more difficult for the public to engage with than music or athletics or things like that. And you don't have to be a professional athlete to enjoy sports. You don't have to be a professional musician to enjoy a concert. And I don't think you need to be a professional scientist in order to engage with, enjoy, and, and partake in the fruits of science and enjoy it as one of the great intellectual pursuits that human beings have ever, uh, uh, in, the, uh, in the history of the planet, really. I mean, there have been other stabs at science, other cultures have had science, but modern science is, is an animal somewhat apart from all the others, from Greek, Egyptian, Chinese, Mayan, et cetera, et cetera, Arab science, all of which were important and all of which were antecedent to ours, but all of which at some point came to an end. Um, and this one may too, this one may too, but so far it hasn't. And none of them had within them the ability to make progress the way this one does. All, virtually all of the sciences were, were involved in the accumulation of facts. They were encyclopedic in their quality. And indeed, most of them had encyclopedias. They made encyclopedias, you know, and that was their crowning achievement, this accumulating all the facts and ideas and all that. 
And I think the uh, science during the is Islamic era of uh, science, yeah. they, the, the goal was, as you mentioned, Patricia Farah actually uh, pointed out that the, the goal is to gather knowledge, not to create or, or, or uh, do more or, or yeah. Right, and, and we should be eternally grateful to them for having gathered all that knowledge right. because otherwise we'd have had to start from zero. It would have been lost in the sands of time. And so, and so it, it was quite useful and quite important, but it wasn't open-ended the way our science is today because I don't think it included things like failure and, and the importance of ignorance. Um, it, it was, as I said, collected facts rather than asked questions. And so, and I think if you can, if we can communicate to the public that this is what science, this is what makes science powerful because there is a tendency on the part of university, you know, PR departments and journalists as well and scientists ourselves to tout the things that work, you know, to go out and make a big story about what we've discovered and this and that and think this is what the public will support. And, and they will, at least in the short term. I once gave a talk, not to get too far off the subject, but I once gave a talk on ignorance and failure. I was invited at UC Davis, and it was curiously to a group of fundraisers. It was to a breakfast that was, but it was all the fundraisers. So of course, somebody at some point stood up and said, well, you know, this is all very nice and we know this is the way it is, but we have to raise money. And I don't see how we're gonna raise money by talking about our failures and what we don't know. And I said to this person, I said, I disagree with you completely. I think it's just the opposite. I think you, you're welcome to tell the public about the wonderful things that have come out of UC Davis, the inventions and this and that. But what they're really gonna get behind is, but listen, we don't know how to cure cancer. We have some ideas, but we have some big questions about how to cure cancer. And the way to do that is to give us money so we can go do it. Because it's the questions that are the most important thing. And what you have at a place like UC Davis or MIT or anywhere that any great institution are people who know how to figure out what the right questions are. And if you can figure out what the right question is, you're on the road. So, so I think that's what you need to sort of tell the public. And, and this also, by the way, now they're going to a slightly different tangent, but I think helps with this question. This, I think, helps in what philosophers have called for years the demarcation problem. That is, how do you tell pseudoscience from real science? And I think one way you tell pseudoscience from real science is that real science claims they don't know. Real science says, well, we have some very good questions and we think we know the right questions, but we don't know the answers. And we're not infallible. The Pope is infallible, but we're not. We, we work with fallibility. We understand that failure occurs. If something can't fail, then, then it's not gonna be good science. We're not on the right track. And so that's how you tell the difference. You know, astrology never fails. That's the way it is with astrology. No matter what you read, you can always somehow or another, no matter what happens in your life, the astrologer will tell you that this is what they predicted. They can read the tarot cards any way they want, et cetera, et cetera. They, they just never fail, right? And so that's why it's not science. But astronomy, you know, has had some great failures, as it were. And, uh, and that's what makes it a science. And so I think you can use failure and ignorance as a way to show people the difference between true science and not true science. Uh, thanks. Uh, and I guess the problem raises when, when an expert or a scientist start spreading pseudoscience. In, in some cases, this happens. Uh, you have mentioned about Newton, who used to do all kind of uh, voodoo uh, science practice and used to believe them. Uh, Linus Pauling, famous Nobel laureate, he used to think that vitamin C is the cure for everything uh, without much uh, scientific evidences. Uh, the problem arises when an, uh, uh, an expert or a scientist says something and people started believing that. So people don't understand that there should be a consensus of scientific uh, knowledge that on some stuff, for example, climate change. If one scientist say that, okay, climate change never occurs, we should not take it uh, as a true fact, but what other 99 uh, climate scientists are saying that should, we should follow. Yes, I think that's, that's right because science, um... Again, in the, with the idea of fallibility and infallibility, science does not come from authority. I mean, we, science is very anti-authoritarian. 
and we question and should question everything. And just because somebody is an expert or famous or has a Nobel Prize or some other award or this or that does not mean that they get a free pass to say largely anything they want and we should consider it true. It doesn't make them any smarter than the next guy about the next thing. Um, and, and you're right, a consensus in science is what's critical. I mean, what, what, and that's why science works because it has this huge infrastructure. That's the difference usually, another difference between science and pseudoscience. We have a tremendous infrastructure of skepticism and doubt that produces tremendous, you know, remarkable findings and nothing else does. I mean, so intelligent design, if you will, has no, has no infrastructure of skepticism and doubt. They don't fail. And so it's not really science. You know, you can believe it, but it's not really science. And someone actually shared the name of the author. It is Catherine Elgin. Yes, Catherine Elgin. Yeah, uh, true Elgin enough. Or Elgin. Yes, thank you. True yeah, enough. Yeah. As MIT Press. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I just saw it. So, um, yes. Kahua D, uh, do you have a, any question? I, I think you raised your hand before. Hello. Hello. A little hard to hear you. Sorry. Okay, probably he's uh, his or hers uh, internet connection is not working. Probably. Okay, uh, we will move on. Kahua. No. Okay, Kahua, you can uh, write your question in the chat box if you have problem in, in, in uh, internet connection. Okay, we'll move on. Okay, um, so I like, Many authors come and talk with us in these uh, discussion sessions. And I ask one question that, what would be the translation rights? And somebody actually asked that, this question in the chat box. If, you tr if anyone wants to translate the books in Bengali, uh, whom should someone contact and how to proceed with those? Well, assuming they want to do it legitimately, <laughs> right, uh, right. they should just contact Oxford University Press because they handle all of that. In fact, ignorance has been translated into, I think, 12 languages. I don't remember all of them and failure into three or four. Uh, failure, it's a long story with the publisher and all the rest of that. I think that failure has not gotten as much attention as ignorance, which got a fair amount of attention and all that. But, but I, in many ways, personally feel that it's actually the more important and more interesting of the two books. So anybody who would like to translate it into another language, I would love to see that. And usually the translation rights are very inexpensive. And it's the only issue is that uh, I don't really understand the ins and outs of it. It's part of the publishing world. But publishers like Oxford University Press often have a translator or translation service in different countries. And that's who they go with. So, for example, in one case, I had somebody who I would like to have had there was a French translation. And I actually had somebody, a colleague in France who I felt could do, could have done a very good job of it. Um, but they insisted on using their own translator who I didn't know and don't know anything about. And of course I have no idea whether it's a good translation or not. But so sometimes they already have some contract in place that they can't get out of, but not always. And so it's worth looking into, but if there was, if you have interest in translating it, that would be, Great, and I would be happy to participate to whatever extent I could in helping, although I've never been asked to in any other way. All the translations have just been done. They tell me, oh, it got translated into such and such a language and they send me a small check, very small check, <laughs> usually. Yeah, uh, and there is like, uh, none of your books have been translated into Bengali, I, I believe. So is that, that right? would be- should be. It's yeah, a huge and audience. I, yeah, yeah, and uh, I I believe that would be very valuable. And if if any of the translators who likes to translate or wants to translate, uh, want to 
translate the book, you can contact me. We can uh, go together to the uh, Oxford Press and then ask them what the procedure is. That, that would be great. I can give you if you say if you if you really develop an interest in this, send me an email and I can find out the editor to go. The the editor I I would have known the editor, but she just retired. But I can find, I know who took over for her. I just can't remember off the top of my head. I have to go look at the email to see who they finally put in place. But if you send me an email, I'll tell you what editor to, uh, to, uh, to contact and use my name as an introduction as well. That would be awesome. That'd be great. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, we are close to the end of our discussion today. Uh, uh, and uh, Actually, Kahua is uh, asking question in the chat box. Let me see. Okay, let's see what it was. Uh, these are kind of general questions. What would be your advice for a student of our generation? I guess uh, she is a young lady. Well, um, you've already made a very good choice. I think that as a career, there's You'll, you'll, you'll never be as satisfied doing anything else in the world as you can be being a scientist. So you'll get a lot of advice about how awful it is and how you know we're always worried about grants and you'll run into graduate students and postdocs who seem to be terribly anxiety ridden about getting a job and all the rest of this. But I can tell you from experience, I've been at many dinners where people have, you know, have been, oh God, grants, I can't get this grant funded, or I don't know if there's jobs, what are we gonna do with this and that? And then I say to people, so yeah, so what do you think would be a better job than this? And they all go, well, what are you crazy? I would never do anything but this, I love this. And, and that's, the way, <laughs> that's the way we are. So, and, and there aren't really very many better jobs in the world. And I think, um, I also like to remind people that, that although you hear all these terrible stories about not many jobs and all the rest of that, it's also true that people get hired. And it's my experience now, having been on search committees and all the rest of that, that although we may get 300 or 350 applications for one job, which sounds horrible, um, in point of fact, it's pretty easy. It's a very bimodal distribution. It's pretty easy to get the top 50 applications from the 350. And those top 50, that top 20% or so, something like that, they're bimodally out there. And although we only had one job, I know there were at least 50 good jobs being offered that year around the country or around the world. And so those top 50 people who applied to all the jobs, the same 350 people that applied to all the jobs, those top 50 people got jobs. You guys are places like MIT and things like that. You, you know, you should enjoy things more and worry a little less. I would say don't worry at all, but if you stay in the top 20%, we need you. Science needs you, the world needs you. You will contribute and it will be worthwhile. So I would be very positive really. Thanks. Uh, I guess the, uh, the audience who asked this question actually asked about herself or, or the younger generation than me who lives back home in Bangladesh, who are uh, school students, uh, wants to be a probably great scientist in the, in the future. What do you advise? Uh, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's, I suppose, on the one hand, trickier, and on the other hand, more straightforward, because the, there's a formula for doing it, as you know, which unfortunately is to not fail, <laughs> to get good grades, to do this, to do that, you know, to, to do some work in a lab and this kind of thing, and then apply to various places and, and you know, you'll get in somewhere. And so there's a kind of a formula for doing it, and it largely works. I don't think it's very positive. I don't think it's very, it's the right formula. But for the most part, it works and you know what you have to do at least and you just go ahead and do it. And then when you get to graduate school, your life will change immensely. So you put up with it for high school, you put up with it for parts, large parts of undergraduate, at least your classwork in undergraduate. And then when you get to graduate school, your life changes completely and you become a scientist. I used to say when I was chair of my department, and I would welcome the new graduate students in each year. The first thing I said to them was, I want you to understand something. Graduate school is not school. We call it graduate school, it's not school. This is your first job. You are here now as a professional. You are an apprentice 
but nonetheless, this is not school. You will do real work, not exercises. You will do work that will be published, there will be a contribution, and that the purpose of graduate school is for us to make you colleagues. We are trying to grow colleagues for ourselves. And so it's a whole different thing than undergraduate, you know, with grades and all that. So at one level, you, I guess, to be sensible, you follow the formula and you, you do that. And, and, and again, I think it's important to realize that, that um, the world is a tremendous shortage of talented scientists in the world. Um, it, it may not seem that way, there's not enough funding for them, but, but believe me, there's a huge shortage uh, it's especially felt in industry. Industry will tell you this in a minute. Industry supports STEM research, you know, STEM programs, not because they're so philanthropic, but because they need employees. They need people to come work in their labs, you know, whether it's tech or biotech or whatever. They're desperate for good, solid people who know how to do science to come work in their laboratories. So aside from academic, there's a tremendous need out there. So it's not as difficult as it as it maybe is made to look. I have to say. Uh, yeah, there is another question. I am going to rephrase it a little. Uh, that is, in our country, a good scientific research culture is lacking. I mean, there is no science-based industries that can support science. For example, if you want to do a sequencing in overnight or in a week, you need to send it to. Uh, probably to India or to China uh, to get back in I, I, I'm talking about Bangladesh so and and also the general people has a lack of scientific knowledge and awareness uh, a lot of people don't want to accept theories like evolution that is a scientific fact that we all know but you can still see these kind of things in US and UK or or in Europe too but there there would be more resistant resistance in in our country we are kind of uh, religiously conservative country so these kind of facts uh, actually gets hampered to be accepted by the general public uh, what do you suggest uh, for the scientists to do uh, to make their scientific works and knowledge to be more uh, accepting to the people? Well, you can't put things down people's throats, of course. You can't force feed them or anything like that. You, you make it available. I think it's important to realize, I think it's important to be understanding a little bit of people who have trouble accepting certain kinds of science. Um, you know, there's a, uh, think of it this way. I mean, listen, we have this in America too. There, you know, there's a statistic that 48%, it's an interesting statistic, I think, that some 48 or 52% of people don't believe in evolution, claim not to believe in evolution. There's a statistic behind that, that I think is very interesting. And I bet it's true elsewhere too which is they may not believe in evolution, but they know what evolution is. It's not like they're stupid. They got it in school. They learned this. They, know, they can tell you about what evolution is. They understand evolution. They don't believe in it. Those are two very different things. Understanding evolution still means they, they're not stupid, right? But believing in evolution, I think for some people, you have to recognize what this means for some people and, and what they get out of it. I mean, really, we all believe in evolution. We're scientists, we believe in evolution, I suppose. But we have a community, we have support. We, we, we're among people who believe that way, we understand it. Um, but what do you really get for believing in evolution if you're a regular person working in Walmart or someplace like that or in a regular store or something like that? It doesn't improve your life. It doesn't make you any better at anything, you know? And it will actually cut you off in some cases. It will cut you off from a religious community that you depend upon for many things in your everyday life, it will cut you off from your family and some friends who, you know, who have strong beliefs about God and this and that. And, and so what's the value in it? Just go ahead and don't believe in evolution. You know what it is. And, and I, I think that's okay. I mean, I don't think it really matters in the end. We should, be, we should recognize that until Darwin in 1859, some of the greatest scientific minds in the world whom we revere today all believed in intelligent design. Newton, 
Faraday, Maxwell, all of these people. I, I'm even, the uh, even immediately after Darwin as well. A lot of oh, scientists. Oh, for many years. Yes, yeah. <laughs> for many years after Darwin. I'm, I'm fond of saying Faraday, you know, was a member of a very mystical Christian sect. Um, and I, I sometimes think that that was part, maybe what enabled him to understand magnetic fields because he was used to believing in invisible shit floating around in the world, you know? He thought there were spirits that were invisible. And so why not have invisible fields of force as well? And so I, there's nothing you can do about all of that, I think. Uh, the technological end of it, I think is, this is difficult, but, but I, you know, you don't have to compete with the most technologically sophisticated laboratory in the world. There's a great deal of science that can be done at a fairly low tech level. And again, this is a question of, you thinking about the questions that interest you, you being curious about, you know, just what's in the world around you and that you can experiment on and not worry about whether you can do RNA seq on, you know, the whole brain or not. Um, because that's not the only way to do science and that's not where an awful lot of really good science comes from. So, you know, I, I think you, you work with what you have often and that's where you know, that's where you'll get around. Darwin didn't have any fancy laboratory. He worked in his garden mostly. So, yeah. you know. Yeah. <laughs> and in one place in your book, you were saying that he was, uh, he was doing botanical experiments, but did not come up with the gene that Mendel has been doing parallelly uh, and yeah. <laughs> didn't know about it at all. So this is one kind of failure as well that you the knowledge has not been transferred or, or accepted by the, the current scientists at the time. Yes, so it's remarkable that there's, a, there's an interesting book. Yeah, another book I could recommend. It's a, little bit, a bit more scholarly, but still quite approachable called, um, well, I'm not positive what it's called, but, it, but the subtitle is Unconsidered Hypotheses. And it's, it's a tracing of, you know, people, great scientists who, who were real trailblazers but couldn't come up with what we now would consider, you know, obvious solutions to problems that they just were unable to somehow or another consider. Uh, Darwin and the gene is a perfect example. He was the man who came up with evolution, but could never figure out what the hereditary particle was. You know, and he had lots of ideas and they were wildly wrong, wildly wrong. And yet, yeah, right down the block as it were, although he didn't know it, yeah. this guy working <laughs> with pea plants doing relatively I mean, they weren't simple experiments. They were rather large. I mean, he grew thousands and thousands of pea plants and kept, you know, meticulous notes and all that. But he did it all with pea plants. I mean, he didn't have a microscope or anything else, you know. I mean, he didn't need any of that high tech. Equipment. Yeah, and not having a formal scientific training as well. That's right. That's right. Just so, curious. <laughs> yeah. Nothing like curiosity. And, and there's so right. many things to be curious about that you don't have to worry about whether you can get sequencing done overnight, I think. <laughs> right, right. Uh, yeah, and uh, okay, I will take one more question from the audience and, and then we'll close this discussion today. Is this okay with you? Probably, yeah, I'm very happy. Yes, I'm having a great time. Okay, if you have time, actually. Uh, Rajib, could you ask your question? Oh, thank you to give me the chance to ask the question. So as the discussion is on the believing the science and scientific data. So these days, uh, like many published journal, uh, like has the data to be like misguided or like manipulated. Like sometimes uh, we are following a paper, a journal, but uh, we are not getting the same result uh, like as the publishers had. And we often heard the things that uh, this published journal's data is manipulated. So like regarding these cases, uh, how much should we believe like any published uh, journal uh, when we have seen such issues frequently and how to deal these things? So, so I guess what you're talking about is, is what um, people have called this sort of replication crisis that all of a sudden it seems that a large number of papers get published, but then the results can't be replicated. And so we, we, we worry about whether any paper can be believed or not. I, I have a slightly different 
opinion about it. I don't think there is a replication crisis. I think replication failures is a very common and necessary part of scientific progress and the way science goes on. Um, now, let me make a quick distinction here. I'm not talking about fraud. I think fraud in science should be punishable by the death penalty, and I don't believe in the death penalty, but it's the <laughs> one place where we depend, we absolutely depend on complete honesty about our results. And so if somebody is perpetrating absolute fraud, I think that's unconscionable and criminal and should be punished as severely as possible. But that's different than people who publish results that they feel they've gotten in good faith, but then can't be replicated. I think that's part of the what we didn't know we didn't know. That when you when another laboratory picks up this paper and tries to use those results but can't get the same results, there's something different. We don't know what it was, but we have to go find out. And so when a paper can't be replicated, I think that doesn't show that the, the people who did it were fraudulent. I mean, maybe they did rush something into, I don't know, maybe they were a little sloppy. But nonetheless, I think most of the time it shows it's just something we weren't so sure of, or that they this lab did something and they, they put it in their methods. So um, I have a kind of a long story about that, so I won't tell it, but, but, but there are many, many cases where something that turned out to be critical just didn't make it in the method section. You know, you read the method section, they say, well, we let this incubate for 35 minutes or 30 minutes or something like that. And then you let it incubate for 30 minutes and it works 20% of the time, but most of the time it doesn't work. And you go play around, you play around. And if you, and I've done this in my laboratory, I've sent a student to the other laboratory that did this work. And I said, you just follow them around and do this experiment with them. And of course it works there. And then they realized that the 30 minute incubation period actually was when they went to get coffee. So okay. it was about 30 minutes. If there was a long line, it was 35 minutes. If there was no line, it was 20 minutes, you know? And if you look at their data sheets carefully, you see, oh, it always actually worked when it was 20 minutes and rarely worked when it was 35 minutes or something like that, you know? And, but, but you never think to put that in your method section you put you know, what you think is important in the method section. And so, um, and so I think it's not that big a problem in an odd way. I think it's actually a useful problem. Sometimes these replication failures are very valuable because it makes us go back and look at something a second time and say, oh, there was more here than we thought. This works, but only in this limited set of cases. But look, we can think about it this way and make it and expand it. So now it works in a much larger set of cases in a much larger context. So I, I think you can still believe most of what's published. Uh, I just think you should be critical thinking and skeptical about everything, of course. That's always the way it is, you know. And the more you know about the field, when you're reading directly in your field, you know if something sounds right or something sounds a little fudged, you know. And you also know it's hard to say you get to know you get to know those people and those laboratories in the field that have a reputation for publishing maybe a little too quickly you know maybe looking for the big story and those laboratories that are careful really really careful and everything they do is dependable so you know you get to know these things thank you very much it it, it answers my question great thanks for the question it's a very useful yeah. one thanks rajib uh last question you publish one book in five years. I mean, I have the data for two books. Are you planning to write anything else? And are you currently writing anything? Uh, what's your like future plan in terms well, of- Yeah, so, so I like writing as it turns out. I didn't know that I would. I never thought I'd write a book. I write papers and things like that. That's you know what you do as a scientist. So having had the chance to write a book, I wrote this book, Ignorance, and I actually rather enjoyed the process. So when they asked me if I wanted to write another one, I jumped at it and said yes. Um, on the other hand, I'm less interested in writing. I've also been offered to write a book if I want to do about olfaction, which is the field I work in, or neuroscience more generally. And I haven't been that interested in doing that. I think there are plenty of books out there already on those topics, maybe for one, and I didn't know whether I had much to add to it. But I am interested in books on this process of science. So I am working on another one now. I've been working on it on and off for a couple of years. And I'm back and forth about whether I really would like to continue writing books or whether I think the essay form is more valuable. 
that writing essays of a few thousand words that just simply uh, that have more um, public appeal, more access to the public, could appear in public, more public magazines might be a better, a better route, a better uh, path to, to communicate with the public than writing a book. But, so I don't know. I'm back and forth on that. I have to say, but I'm I'm always writing. A, I'm always working a book. You may have noticed that failure and ignorance was this way too. Is in many ways a collection of essays. The chapters don't really follow carefully along some uh, argument to a conclusion that's irrefutable. They're mostly not stray thoughts, but mostly attacking the problem from as many different angles as I can think of. So in some ways they could stand as a collection of essays as well as a book. And that's kind of the way I write. So that's what I'm playing with now. I have a computer drive full of essays that are half finished. Cool. I hope that we, we will get the book published soon and you will appear in our discussions again. <laughs> well, I hope so too. I hope so too. This was very enjoyable. This is very nice. Questions were excellent. I yeah. really appreciate your sticking with it all this time. And I hope everybody's safe and well wherever you are. Apparently people are all over the world. Thank you very much for being with us today. Thanks everyone. That will be all from us. It was, it was my pleasure. Happy reading. I think Take it's great. Care. Thank you. Thank you, Khan. Bye now.